Hi there, my name is Christian Eschbach, and welcome to Confessions of a Domestic Engineer. And I hope Kevin Smith spends the rest of his life walking barefoot on Lego. If you cannot guess by that intro, I watched the first five episodes of Masters of the Universe on Netflix, and I'm not impressed with Kevin Smith right now. Let's be upfront, there are spoilers in this episode, okay? Um, because I'm going to talk about specifics as to why I don't, I was. Specifics that I do not like about Kevin Smith's adaptation of He-Man. Um, the very first thing I want to get into is Kevin Smith and his promotion for this screwed up. If Kevin Smith had come out and said, I'm going to do Masters of the Universe... You, sticking closer to the source material than the last adaptation, but still taking it in my own direction, that would have been one thing. But this was billed literally as a continuation of the 1983 He-Man. My He-Man. Okay, this is this is this is my He-Man as a kid. This was the He-Man I loved. I had He-Man action figures before I had a little sister, okay? That, that's how this works, all right? Just barely, but I had He-Man action figures before I had a little sister. Um, let me, you know what? I'm going to talk about the parts I, I really like about the show before we get into anything else, Okay. The one thing I do really like is the casting they did for the show. The casting was fantastic. I really like it. I'm going to get into it a little bit as we go. Um, I was really hopeful when I saw a lot of the cast that got parts in here. Then I started hearing some of them in the roles and I lost a little of my passion for it. And... Then I, you know, there was, there was a few other things going on uh, with the voice work in there. It was kind of like, I was really excited in one way and then got to it. And it was kind of like, oh, maybe I'm not as excited now. Um, the animation itself is spectacular. Uh, obviously, I love the fact that they're using heavily the 1983 version as a reference as opposed to the reboot in the 2000s. That being said, they did pull one thing from the reboot I liked that was changed drastically from the continuation. And that was the way that Prince Adam was drawn. Uh, we all, as kids, did complain about the fact that Prince Adam looked exactly like He-Man did. That was done for action figure purposes. It made it cheaper to mass produce and release basically the same figure with a different outfit. You know, kind of like Barbie. But, <laughs> but um, in the new series, even though it's supposed to be a direct continuation, they did make Prince Adam look smaller, more youthful, like they did. Not as bad as they did in the reboot series, I want to say around 2000 or shit. So that's what I've got the sides here to go with. Um, I actually did like the reboot. I wasn't fond of necessarily how they drew everyone. Maybe a little bit too many tassels. I didn't mind the tassels too much, but maybe a little heavy on the tassels. Um, but I really liked the way that that one expanded the mythology. I really liked the way that that one went with the storyline and how it progressed a lot of the classic characters and gave them real storylines and stuff like that that the original show didn't do as well in some cases. Um, Slam Fist being one of the ones I distinctly remember did not get the proper... And, and I use Slam Fist because Slam Fist is in the new one, makes a cameo in the new one. But that's all it is, is just a cameo. And I'm going to get more into that. But the animation is really good in the new one. Really, really good in the new one. 
Kevin Smith claims that it's going to expand on the original story. It does a little bit, but not that, so far. So far, it hasn't expanded on the mythology all that much. And the ones, there's been two spots where it did expand on the mythology. In the very beginning, when it's talking about Eternity, Eternia, and Eternia being kind of like the center of the universe or, you know, of every, of creation and blah, blah, blah. That was a little bit of an expansion. I get into that a little bit. So the beginning, there was a little bit of expansion. And then they get into the heaven and hell kind of side of, Eter of their mythology a little bit. But even that wasn't overly new because the second a Shadow Beast popped up, I knew exactly what it was. Right away, I went, Shadow Beast! I got all excited because it was a Shadow Beast. Shadow Beasts were awesome. But, you know, Shadow Beast wasn't something new, you know. I, I don't remember the land that it was off the top of my head, sorry. It is not something new. Um, then we get into, I believe, what they were calling Preternia. And Preternia would be... You could look at it kind of like a prehistoric Eternia. The idea is it was their way of nodding to all the original drafts and all the original concept artwork for He-Man. Seriously, that's what it was. That's what Preternia was. It was a nod to the original artwork and the original concept drawings and stuff like that for the original He-Man series, including concepts for the toys and stuff like that. Right down to the original Barbarian design they had had as well. Um, there was one or two of the original designs that weren't there, but anyways, um, great action. The storytelling is pretty decent. It, it's not, when it comes to the storytelling, as if you look at it as a kid's cartoon, great storytelling, really well done. I really like it. If you look at it as an adult and thinking that this is going to be a continuation for us adults, it's not going to be quite the same. It's still really good. It's still really enjoyable. I still really like it. I still love the story that they've told in the first five episodes. The, the idea behind the story. I like where they were heading with it and what they're trying to do with it. All right. Now let's start getting into the where I get into the nitty gritties. Now a little bit. When you see me looking up, looks like I'm looking in the distance. I'm looking at IMDb. I've got IMDb up in front of me right now, so I can talk about the cast and how this works in relation with everything in here as well. Okay. I got really excited with a lot of the cast that I was hearing about getting cast for the movie, like Sarah Michelle Gellar as Tila. I thought that would be a good, solid casting. Um, and the reason I thought that would be a good solid casting is I thought they were going to cast strong, confident, I don't want to say Buffy, but strong, confident Buffy. And I'm talking Buffy, WB Buffy before the switch to the CW. When Buffy was strong, when Buffy was confident, when Buffy was truly badass and was not some weepy emo bitch. That's the Sarah Michelle Geller voiceover we got doing Tilo. We got the CW. Was it CW? UPN? UPN? CW. Whatever it was. I don't remember. The one. <laughs> UPN. Whatever. Anyways, when Buffy went from WB over to the other network, whichever one it is that I'm blanking on, CW or UPN network, um. That moody Buffy, that version of Buffy that no one really liked and you got into all the other characters more so, that's what Tila sounds like. She really sounds like whiny Buffy after she came back from the dead. And a lot of the stuff that, a lot of the, I've heard Sarah Michelle Gellar do much better. I've liked her portrayal of characters much better where she's been a lot where she's been believable as a strong confident female and the way she's being played up in here which gets into spoiler number one in the original cartoon Tila by the end of the run of the original cartoon Tila either 100% knew because it was told to or she figured it out or something like that or she had a damn good idea that Prince Adam was He-Man. 
when you start up the new show, she play they play it up like she has no idea whatsoever. They play her as a complete idiot. And Tila wasn't an idiot. Tila always ex suspected something weird was going on. That was part of the beauty of her character. Was He-Man had to go hide it from her because she was always kind of around and they need to find an excuse to get her him away from her so he could go transform and stuff like that. And it was to protect everybody else so Skeletor and all henchmen wouldn't go after everybody else the same way. You know what I mean? You know, it was to protect the king and queen because, let's face it, they would have went after the king and queen more often than they would have went after Castle Grayskull if they had known that that was He-Man's parents, right? It makes logical sense. The way they have Sarah Michelle Gellar playing up the character of Tila doesn't make sense for the character of Tila. She was never that, like, I mean, she was on par with Prince Adam for kind of whininess, sort of. But they were more... I don't want to say sibling-esque, but they were kind of like those two kids that grew up next door that, you know, you could see ending up together. And in the original storyline, which they haven't brought up yet in the new one, and they keep alluding to, and us old-school fans know it, is that Tila is the sorceress's daughter. So, in a way, we always kind of expected He-Man and the sorceress, or He-Man and Tila to kind of end up together for that reason. That could still end up, end up happening here. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. But the whole way around, I don't like the way they've played up Tila. She should be a strong, confident female, and she sounds like a whiny bitch. That, that, that's my complaint there. While I'm talking about Tila, I'm going to mention her partner, Andra. Andra? However it's said there. Okay, so... Yes, He-Man did not have enough characters of color representation. <laughs> Wait, let me rephrase that. Yes, He-Man did not have enough characters of human color representation on the original run. Okay, 1983, they weren't worried about a black audience, a Latino audience, an Asian audience. It, it wasn't a factor back in those days. I, 1983, I, I was five years old, you know, depending on what part, point 1983 we're talking I was four to five years old, depending on what point 1983 we're talking about. Um, it's not, I'm not in any way justifying it. I'm okay with them adding a black character for the sake of adding a black character because there wasn't one, okay? I can make the joke about how they had every other character or color under the sun, but because there is a white barbarian dude, yeah, there should be a black character. I would have even been okay if they would have taken one of the older classic characters and retconned them black. Um, I mentioned Slam Fist earlier. If they retconned Slam Fist black, I would have been okay with that. You know, if they had retconned one of the other just basic white guys into a... I don't mean just basic, you know what I mean. If they, took, if they retconned one of the white guys that were clearly kind of white guys and made them black, I would have been okay with that. Um, because there, there definitely was a, di uh, a diversity issue, okay? So I I'm not going to argue that. My complaint is... They added another female cast member, which honestly wasn't necessary because... Tila is a very strong, was always a very strong presence and a very strong female character. She was not the sorceress. The sorceress was a pathetic female character. Weak, feeble, yeah, help me, He-Man, help me. He's supposed to be the old bad sorceress. And so he's, help me, He-Man, help me. Okay, so or sorceress wasn't cool. Tila was always cool. Tila could always hang with He-Man and could always do everything that He-Man can. So we didn't need, I mean, okay, compared to all the other dudes, yeah, okay, maybe we need a little more representation that way. But basically the character of Andra it doesn't, doesn't really, to me, bring anything to the table. 
it, she hasn't really been anything of real relevance, you know? Um, there was a lot of rumors that they were going to play Tila up as a lesbian with her blab. You know, all the people that bitch about the woke stuff, I didn't find it woke at all. What they did was... I don't I don't like the female part, which I'll get into in a couple minutes, because there's more to it than that. But I don't think it was woke. I think it was appropriate representation that needed to be put in there to a degree. All right. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up with the female side is I my biggest complaint is I wanted to watch He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, not She-Ra. I liked my male-centric cartoon. I'm sorry, folks. They had She-Ra for a specific reason. They made She-Ra for a specific reason. And guess what? Most girls that I knew that liked He-Man weren't necessarily into She-Ra because they wanted to watch He-Man. They wanted to watch the big, tough, rough, and rum, you know. And my my ex-wife was a huge He-Man fan. She was also actually a very big She-Ra fan, too. Huge He-Man fan to the point where when we got divorced, she got the He-Man box set because it was bought for her. <laughs> I got G.I. Joe and Transformers. She got He-Man. My son, who, you know, obviously came along many years later, he's actually got the box set for the the, the reboot series because we had bought, uh, a friend of ours had bought that for him. So, I've got DVD copies of both, and I've watched both recently, you know, like, when I say recently, within the last five, ten years. Really good series, both of them, okay? Um, but the key thing to those series were how they were cartoon for boys. And they weren't all about violence. Like, there really is... One thing I do like about the new show is they kept some of the the... the the morals in there, you know, the, the lessons you could learn. The Lena Lena Headley Hetty Hetty, sorry, Lena Hetty, who I love from the Sarah Connor Chronicles, and I know most other people love to hate from Game of Thrones. Uh, fantastic actress, cast as Evil Lynn. First off, I love hearing her with her British accent. That is awesome. Secondly, love the woman's voice. Third, fantastic casting. Another incredibly strong female who I've seen in other roles. Incredibly strong. She is still strong in this. And I always liked Evelyn in the cartoon. I like Evelyn here now too. They did a really good job with Evelyn. But the thing is, is we're now at a show where Sarah Michelle Gellar, Lena Hetty, and Tiffany Smith, who is Andra, have dominated. So here's the thing. We're going to get into spoiler time now. He-Man and Skeletor both die in the first episode. If you haven't watched the damn Netflix episode series, please stop watching this. I don't want to ruin it for you. But And there is definitely, obviously, a comeback later on, which I'll get into. Um, but they do. They both legitimately die, and it is a good death. It's a solid death. I have no qualms at all, storyline-wise, what they did with He-Man, what they did with Skeletor related to their deaths, and how it plays out by the fifth episode. The story arc used for those two is fine. By the way, Mark Hamill as Skeletor, great, except for one major thing. He tries, you can tell every time he's trying not to laugh because he's going to start sounding like the Joker when he laughs. My only complaint... Otherwise, Mark Hamill was the perfect person to pick to do the voice of Skeletor in this, and uh, no complaints there. Okay, back to the girls. So, you kill off He-Man, you kill off Skeletor right at the beginning. So now you've got Sarah Michelle Gellar as Tila, Lena Hetty as Evelyn, and Tiffany Smith as Andra leading the show. So we've gone from, uh, from it being a male-centric cast to now a female-centric cast. He-Man was a boy's cartoon. I'm sorry, it was a boy's cartoon. No one want, no, none of us boys from 1983 want to watch a show starring Tila, Evelyn, and Andra. That was called She-Ra. 
If we wanted to watch that, we'd watch She-Ra. Okay, so that's my first major, major bitch. Now, what goes with that is Man at Arms is in there. Uh, Man at Arms played by Liam Cunningham. Great job. Great. Sounds fantastic. Um, but Liam Cunningham, um, but Man at Arms isn't there anywhere near what he should be. You know, um, he's treated as this big, bad outcast for keeping Adam secret. Now, being treated like a big, bad outcast by the king and queen, or by the king, by the king, because the queen knew, and she hid it from the king, and this is the, here's the problem, okay? The queen knew and hid it from the king. That's okay. Man, arms hides it from the king. That's wrong. He's banished. Not only is he banished, but he's banished in Tila, who he raised. He raised 100% on his own at behest of the sorceress. And that secret's still been kept from Tila, too. She doesn't know that one yet at this point in, the in this version of the show. Even though in the original it was alluded to as well, where she kind of started to wonder. But... In this version, she doesn't know. But she's completely ostracized the man that raised her, the only man that she's ever known as dad, to the point where she calls him Duncan. This is her dad. This is the man that raised her. She didn't have a mom. She did not have a mom on the show. She never did. She had Men at Arms, which was her dad. And she totally shits all over. Because he didn't tell her. Well, it wasn't his place to tell her. You know, it was Adam's place. It was. It's like, it's like the argument of back in the old days when you accidentally outed somebody before they were ready to come out. You know, um, you don't out another. You don't out a superhero. You don't. You don't out a superhero. You do not give up their secret identity. Okay. You know you. Someone finds out Peter Parker or Spider-Man, guess what? They keep it to themselves. Unless they're a bad guy. Because what happens? Bad guys get a hold of it. In the Marvel's Ultimates universe, that is literally why Peter Parker gets killed. Because all the bad guys find out he's Peter Parker and where to find him. So, Kevin Smith as a comic book writer. Kevin, Because he is. He's a comic book writer. Not as a movie writer. And Kevin Smith has written some good comics. Kevin Smith, as a comic book writer, should know that that was a horrible, horrible, stupid, petty, bullshit thing to contrive that storyline off of. That was a horrible concept. Bad. Then, Man at Arms is barely there. You get to see Orko. You know what they do to Orko? They trap they they leave Orko trapped in hell. Yeah. In the what was what they're, or they're calling the dark side or the hell side of the attorney and afterlife, Orko gets trapped there so everybody else can escape. They Kevin Smith trapped Orko in hell. Even if they bring him back for some magical special happy ending at the end. Kevin Smith trapped Orko. Orko one of the most important people in the He-Man mythos. Mythos, whichever way you want to pr pronounce it. He traps them in hell. Um, I would like to point out the animation they did on Orko in this series. Orko's eyes are absolutely beautiful. And the work and the animation that went into Orko's eyes in certain scenes, the, 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 the pain, the anguish, the hurt in his eyes, you can see it. it it's really well drawn and really well there. But Mother left Orko in hell. The only other hero from the original lineup that we get as any type of major player or any type of real thing other than a quick cameo. Like, even Cringer, outside of the first episode where you get the whole He-Man set up, the battle with Skeletor, Lisa, when you get away from that and you get to Cringer, 
and you get to see Cringer again, they even fuck up the character of Cringer to a degree. And in a way where you just kind of go, really? All right, fine. Okay. Because, you know, Cringer has this big, giant, courageous moment. And yeah, Cringer, once in a blue moon, would have them, but it just didn't feel right for Cringer. It felt out of place. Now, outside of Cringer, who only basically gets a freaking cameo, Cringer gets a cameo! Cringer! Cringer! I also have issues with the fact that Cringer reverted back to Battle Cat when He-Man died and didn't get stuck in Battle Cat form because Cringer was technically in Battle Cat form and to me should have been stuck in Battle Cat form, but, you know, hey, whatever. Bad writing on that one. Um, but the only other major He-Man character is uh, Roboto. Roboto was a... For this story, Roboto's necessary, and I'm okay with them using Roboto. The thing is, is Roboto was a secondary character that basically got a single episode just to sell his action figure. I think he popped up maybe two or three times tops, but when you look at characters like Ram Man, Mechanek, Stratos who were around regularly. Um, and then, you know, there's other ones as, as well. They get, you know, it was nice to see Moss Man make an appearance in there as well. Um, but it was like some of the weird off ones that didn't get a lot of play in the original are the ones that got played up more here and the ones that were actually big players that would be the ones that, like... If you watch the original cartoon, the idea that there is a quest going on that was going through heaven and hell to try and reform this sword, this, that, and the other thing, and Ram Man was left out? I mean, now, Ram Man was always treated kind of as the goofy, dumb guy who had... We'll say that, you know, his brain was shook. And nowadays, we'd say it's like concussion syndrome, and they probably left Ram Man out because they don't want kids imitating Ram Man. Not that any of us ever did, because that hurt to try and imitate Ram Man. But, you know, apparently kids were a million times stupid nowadays, so maybe that's why they left Ram Man out. I don't know. But there's this whole pantheon of classic heroes that were regular major players they could have pulled from to complete out this quest. But instead, they've got Tila pissed off, basically, at men because one man lied to her. That, that's what it works out. Or two men, sorry. Two men and whatever Orko is. Two men, whatever Orko is, and the queen. Now, she does get equally pissed at the queen. But let's be very clear. I am still not happy with the fact that the queen knows what's going on, but it's only all the guys that hung out with He-Man that get punished. Tila doesn't even get punished. Man-at-Arms gets banished because he knew about Adam. But Tila, who was raised by Man-at-Arms, who fought side-by-side -side with He-Man on a regular basis, palled around and played with Prince Adam on a regular basis, and clearly was too dumb to figure it out. All right. You see where I'm going with this. Now, there are things I really do like that they played with. I do like what they did with Triclops. I do like they brought in this whole technology thing. But when I bring in what they did with Triclops, one of my favorite villains, all-time favorite villains, and I know he was dumb, he was goofy, but I absolutely loved him. He was a great, bad, cheesy henchman. Was Trapjaw. And that whole stunt where they have Trapshaw put his own buzzsaw through his own fucking skull? I mean, sure, they don't show it. But that was horrible. That was really, really, really stupid. Really stupid. And instead of leaving him dead, you know, because we leave Orko trapped in hell, but we bring... Trapjaw back as some cybernetic abomination instead. <sighs> Just so inf 
infuriating. Now, when I was a kid, uh, He-Man came out um, and got really popular right around the time my sister was born in 1983. And... I remember the very first two He-Man figures I ever got. The very first two He-Man figures I ever got were Men at Arms and Beast Man. It was great to see Beast Man brought back in. But Beast Man, instead of being this big, powerful, can control beast, something to be reckoned with monster of a dude who worked with Skeletor is now basically Eva Lynn's large guard dog? Seriously! Beastman's been relegated down to a large guard dog. I, I want to try so hard to say that this show's not trying to be woke, but the problem is, it is. Like, they really crapped all over... Every single one of the major players and major characters in the He-Man series and relegated them to a bunch of screwed up... You know, it's not like they're all suffering from PTSD. It's not like they're all hurt showing... They're not showing the hurt any of these guys are experiencing. It's all about Tila's pain and suffering. Because... Someone lied to her. Imagine if she had found out about Santa Claus not being real. Imagine if she... That's... Seriously. She's acting like... She's an adult acting pissed off because she just found out that... You know, her parents lied to her about the Tooth Fairy, Easter Bunny, and Santa Claus all at the same fucking time. Oh, and their pet that went to go live on the farm. Whereas all the guys on this show, they're not allowed to hurt. They all still have to be classic cliche male caricatures where they're not allowed to show their pain. They're not allowed to show their suffering. They're not allowed to show how they've been affected. They all have to just suffer in silence. Tila can go around screaming and whining and bitching like crazy. Now, they only released five out of what, if I go by IMDb, looks like eight episodes. Now, it says here that He-Man's in eight episodes, whereas Tila's in six. I'm not entirely sure how that works. Because I didn't think Tila was really left out of the first episode, and maybe they're planning on leaving her out of the last episode. I don't know. Um... Let's say there's eight episodes. They have released five. We know that they're going to release the last set. There is a huge part of me right now, based off of what I'm seeing here, based off of what's going on, that thinks they pulled the last episode. Or the last two episodes to retool them, reanimate them. Now, figuring that the animation is most likely done by computer... So it won't be god-awful horrible to have to reanimate or recut and redo in certain spots. The longer it takes for the last bit of the episodes to come out, the worse I'm going to think about it. And the wor more I'm going to think that they went and made a lot of changes to appease fans. I really, once again, if this show had not been branded as a continuation of the 1983 show, I would have been fine. If it was branded as inspired by, but a new moving forward from there, not not really kind of using the old material, but not really, I would have been okay Basically, with it. Basically, to me, Kevin Smith lied. Kevin Smith said he was a huge fanboy when he wasn't, because there was past evidence of Kevin Smith fly out saying he wasn't a fan of He-Man. Not to say that he wasn't... He didn't like He-Man. Just that, you know, there's G.I. Joe's, there's Transformers, there's Star Wars. He-Man wasn't his bag. And I think he even said G.I. Joe, not necessarily. But Kevin Smith's slightly older than me. So that's okay that that wasn't so much as thinking he was more Star Wars with that. And then by the time He-Man came around, he was a little too old. So for him not to be a huge fan of He-Man, I can understand that. I can get that. 
But to make it sound like he was a huge fan, he was going to do this giant, great fall of that everybody was waiting for. And then to drop a Tila-driven, female-driven He-Man in the... I mean, yes, he doesn't call it He-Man in the Masters Universe. Now it's just Masters of the Universe. But to drop a show on us where it's only got one... One of the original heroes on this main quest... A new hero, which, you know, it's okay, because like I said, they need to add a black character for diversity, and I get it. In this particular case, you might catch me roll my eyes when I say it or stuff like that. Part of that's out of ha habit. But in this case, I'm not going to complain about adding a diversity character. It is necessary. Um, and then... But otherwise, it's Evelyn and Beastman. So you got brand new, good, bad, bad. Because they kill Orko off. Because Orko did go with it. Orko didn't start the quest with them. But Orko did go with them. You know, um... Really... If Kevin Smith wanted to make... Tila and the Masters of the Universe, he should have built it as Tila and the Masters of the Universe. I'm hoping that in the fa last, theoretically, three episodes, Kevin Smith vindicates himself. I'm not going to hold my breath on it right now. Um, and depending on how long it takes for those episodes to come out, depends on how much I'm going to believe it's originally was written like that and how much I'm going to think, you know, he went back and redid it because he's catching a lot of crap. Um, and to the point where, you know, he's making up excuses. Like, and if it was any other director, any other actor saying these things, they'd be called out for making up excuses, the same thing, you know. Like Rotten Tomatoes, when I checked last, it had a 36 or a 37 on fan for Rotten Tomatoes. And people are just saying fans are bombing it, blah, 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 blah. I've only seen one person flat out say they enjoyed it. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad show. I'm saying that it was good enough. I'm definitely going to give it a chance to give it a good conclusion. I'm hoping Kevin Smith pulls it out. But I'm not happy with what he did. It's not a good continuation of what was my cartoon. It was not the way it was built and what we got are not what I was expecting. Anyways, those are my thoughts. Those are my views. It's my opinion. You know, you might have a different opinion. Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion. Leave me your comments. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. I do have a Patreon. You can follow me there. Go there. I got a lot of cool stuff that's directly just available for Patreon people there. And, um, yeah, other than that, peace, love, and take care.